series not much talked about these days. The series has had its ups and downs, but I feel it's definitely a strong series, continually getting better and better with each iteration. I've only played the first three, and that was about a year ago. Now just getting back, I'm ready for that good old Wild West vibe in Wild Arms 4. Except, not so much. Now the general consensus I heard about this was that it wasn't worth playing. Many complained of the story, characters, length, and change of setting. I'm more concerned with the gameplay, as I favor that much more, and I knew this was the start of a new system called the Hex System. And that's what got me interested, as the previous three were traditional turn-based RPGs. Change could be a good or bad thing, but I'm always open to new gameplay experiences. More on that later. 3 definitely was the most western of the bunch, and no doubt my favorite so far. This goes for a more generic fantasy magic sort of thing, which is upsetting considering the awesome setting in Wild Arms 3. They do have some western themed towns, but they're limited. This didn't bother me too much, as the story is centered around a different setting anyway. What did bother me was the story. I'll be honest, I didn't take all of the story in, and so my synopsis isn't very detailed. Our typical hero, Jude, starts in a typical village called Ciel. The town is isolated away from the world, and Jude knows very little of the outside. Life is all good and simple until the army, called the Bryonic Forces, attack. Jude curiously sneaks inside one of their ships, somehow, and finds a girl imprisoned called Yuli. He vows there to get her out and escape. Along the way, he teams up with Arnaud, who works as a drifter, getting money for odd jobs. Jude unsuccessfully saves her, and returns to his village to see what's happening. There, he sees his mom, the villagers, and Yuli hold up, and obviously Jude goes in with no weapons to fight back. He there finds an arm, a mysterious weapon to fight back with. Some stuff happens, and Jude and the gang leave in escape pods, leaving his mom behind. Shortly after landing in an unknown area, they find a village and meet Raquel in an inn. They join up for a simple journey, but of course, there's more than that. During the story, there's a scene showing off all ten members of the Bryonic Forces, the main antagonists, though it's hinted there is a secret eleventh member. These members believe that they are going to remake the human race by means of natural selection. By causing massive harm against the population, they hope to evolve humans to be stronger. Take a good look, because you'll be taking down each and every one of them. There's a high council of old men as well, who really run the show, and are just using these members as a way to gain immortality. Typical adults lying, another theme of this game. Jude later discovers how his village and his mom were scientists involved in creating arms for the army, in hope of ending a war ten years ago. The scientists created arms for making a new future, not for war. They threw away all research and isolated themselves in a village, where our protagonist lived. He finds out a man called Hauser ended the war as a hero, and destroyed Raquel's hometown in the process. They never say it directly, but it becomes obvious this is a Jew's father, which was never explained anyway, nor did he even question it. Yuli also finds her long-lost brother, Kresnik, who turns out to be a member of the Bryonic forces, as well as an arms user. Both Yuli and Kresnik grew up in labs, so they can be engineered to be arms users as well, although Kresnik can only wield a prototype, and Yuli can only control them. I will say, the cutscenes are definitely something else. In the beginning, they're nothing special, but near the end, you'll be laughing your asses off at the remarkable animations. They have this one scene where Jude's mom gets blown up along with the other scientists. I don't know why, but I found this scene hilarious. Here's another one with Lambda, the head of the Bryonic forces, beating up some rocks. Though this one takes the cake. to live! 
listen to me! I won't let you destroy what you sought to protect! Even if I have to turn my guns against you! What, an 11th missile? surpass those who have come before them. I've done all that I can. Now it's all up to you to go further. Go now. The future of the world is in your hands, children. Go! Ah, breathtaking. Oh yeah, this guy here? He's important too. Your party meets him shortly later. He drags in one of the villagers of Seattle from a forest. He tells them he's a drifter. How can adults lie? He also says he's looking for some war criminal. They part and meet all over the game. We find out that he's that secret 11th member they were talking about. He takes Yuli away, but they go rescue her anyway. The story's main theme is adults are the suck and children rule. Don't ask me why they thought this would work since Jude and the gang will grow up at some point and become the very thing they hate. Throughout the story, Jude goes from being a dumb, wimpy child into a child with convictions. You'll be hearing convictions a lot in the dialogue, and one character only lives on convictions. Didn't know you could fuel your life on that, but whatever. The character development, as is the story, is the weakest I've seen so far. Many of the characters are one-dimensional and unrelatable, not to mention the dialogue being dry, driven by friendships and convictions. Oh, and adult sucking. Of course, children have the right idea all along, and know how to create the future for everyone. Selfish pricks. For the sake of time, I'll leave the rest of the story out. It's not very good or interesting anyway. You're really not missing out. But what you shouldn't miss out on is the gameplay. When the party gets into any battle, a field of seven hexes are created. Your characters are placed randomly on the field, as are your enemies and lay points. Sometimes there are obstacles, like boxes, and traps, like bombs, placed as well. This makes the random battles just that, really random. Now at first I thought this was fantastic, but it's also not the best. There are more than a handful of times that due to the enemy placement and speed, some battles are completely unwinnable. For example, your party getting ambushed, making the enemies go first, having all of your party members in the middle hex, and all the enemies spamming attack and magic on you. You don't even get a turn to heal. Now, if this was any other JRPG, obviously the game wouldn't have any merit. So how do they handle these encounters? They give you a continue option. From here, the battle restarts, as does the character and enemy placements. Even if you had an ambush or a preemptive strike, they get reset as well. Now, for ordinary encounters, you don't use this too often. But for bosses or purifying battles, you will. After winning a battle, all HP is refilled, so no worries on healing after battles. You also have the chance of getting chest at the end with a random item. These can be anywhere on the hexes, and even if you don't get it, the game will show you what you lost just to rub it in your face. If a character dies during battle and isn't revived, their health will be reduced, but can be healed back when an item or going to a breakpoint, the save point of this game. Breakpoints refill all lost HP and MP, giving you the ability to modify Jude's arm and have useless meetings with your teammates. You can also purify these in battles, but what makes these hard is that all the enemies are placed in detonation mode. This gives them a boost to all their stats, and having 4 or 5 enemies in it is very hard. Your party members can also get into this, but it's luck based, so don't expect it too often. Though this can be forced with an accessory for one turn. These are the worst battles in the game, period. They're much harder than the final boss for crying out loud. Because of their detonation, and your placement, most of these become unwinnable, making you constantly hit the continue button until you have just the right placement, and even then, you'll have to struggle. The purpose of purifying is after winning, you can turn off all encounters for that dungeon, making getting to the boss that much easier. 
Now why is this so good? Because random encounters give you very little in terms of XP and Jella. Seriously, you need like 40k XP in the last dungeon, and you'll only get anywhere from 400 to 1000 something from encounters. Turning off encounters makes the useless battles easier to deal with, though the encounter rate is pretty fair anyway. So how does the gameplay work? A character can move on any hex as long as an enemy or obstacle doesn't occupy it. They can only move to a hex next to theirs, which limits their range. They can also join up with other members on a single hex. A member can only attack any hex next to theirs, again limiting their range. If there is more than one enemy on that hex, then you hit all of them. Any buffs or debuffs casted are applied only to the hex, so if a party member moves out of a hex with poison, the member is free from poison. Oh, and force points are shared this time around. Seems fair. So what can the enemy do? Exactly what you can do. Except bosses, who will have their own special abilities. Bosses were my favorite part of this game. I would really call this game a boss rush, since there are at least two per dungeon, as well as being your primary means for leveling up and getting the most money you can for new equipment, which become really expensive. These are the only battles with preset fields, so there's no luck in placement. Each boss, meaning all of the Brionic members, have a unique ability and can really change the way you play. Most of them are pretty easy, but finding out what their weakness is is the fun part, and thankfully the continues help. For example, Hugo has very fast speed, and if you attack him, he will go to an adjacent hex and you'll miss. How do you get around this? Through trial and error, you find out that he can only move to an adjacent hex, if there's one available. The trick is to get him out of the middle hex, and then surround his hex with everyone. Now he cannot escape, and you win in a few turns. Enil was also a great fight. She had the ability to make clones of the party members. When you start, you might just go all out and start killing all the clones first. This leads to instant death. The only way to kill all the clones is for the original, say Jude, to kill his clone only. If Yuli's clone occupies the same hex as Jude's clone, and Jude attacks that hex, Jude is fine, but Yuli dies. So that whole thing about enemies joining up in hexes? Yeah, that comes into play a lot in this fight, and you gotta work around that. Not to mention, even if that clone dies, she spawns another one in her hex. She never attacks or moves, so she's not a problem. One of the last, Farmel, also was interesting. She's a master of countering, and if you attack her during a certain stance, she may attack back for a one-hit KO. She never moves or attacks, she just counters. She has three stances, Darkness, which counters any attack, Fortress, which she counters physicals, and Barrier, which she counters magic. You basically go against what she counters, killing her easily. There are also some battles with more than one boss, and these can combo with each other. The trick is to kill one quickly, so they can't use their deadly combo attacks. So the bosses have good individuality, but so do your party members. I'm surprised they made them complement each other so well. It looks like they put a lot of time into making them, and you need that for a battle system like this. Each character has a specific role they fill, and as per usual, each member also has an FP skill to complement them. Jude is the speedy arms user, having skills that hit in a straight line, as well as being able to hit hexes opposite from him, giving him more range. He also has an auto-reload skill that activates randomly after his turn, which I thought was pretty cool. You can upgrade his arm like in the previous games, using altar parts found throughout chests. Altar parts can upgrade your attack power or action, making you hit more than once. You also got dragon fossils that can upgrade various other things, like the chance of auto-reloading, criticals, and bullets. He's a mystic user of this game due to his speed. You can use healing berries to heal everyone, nor lucky angelic cards to put those effects on all the hexes. Yuli is the healer and buffer. She can heal or cast buffs to any hex. She also has some interesting skills like gathering the party in one hex, or trading turns with another member. Her fourth skill is material, which summons a monster depending on what lay point she's on. There will be three randomly generated lay points during a battle, fire, water, wind, and earth. Depending on the member placement, Yuli can start the battle with a summon to deal damage to all enemies. If the hex is blank, she can heal all party members instead. The cutscenes are nice, as you do see the monsters actually materialize in the world, but thankfully they're skippable. Arno is the debuffer and magic user. Same deal as Yuli, if he occupies a hex with a lay point, his main attack, Blast, changes element depending on that lay point. If it's a blank hex, he does a non-elemental attack. He's one of the most crucial characters, as he can manipulate hexes to slow down enemies and lock them inside. Usual method for bosses was to slow them down, lock them in, and lower their defense. 
This makes any boss not an issue. He also has the four skill jump, which makes him and any party member on that hex move to a different spot. I didn't use this too much, but in certain situations it was helpful. Raquel is your hard hitter, though she can be pretty vulnerable due to her low speed, which you can manipulate later with buffs anyway. She's so strong that there are solo playthroughs done only with her. She can pretty much one or two hit kill any normal enemy, and less than five or so for any boss. The problem is she doesn't get her turn often, but her force scale, Intrude, allows her to act twice in a turn. Oh, and you can apply Intrude again and again until you run out of FP, as well as an ability to add FP to herself, making any boss laughable. She also has some nice attacks that can drain enemies and apply poison to axes. I do still prefer the way they individualize characters in Wild Arms 3 with the use of the mediums in each character's own arm, but we can't have everything. So how does this all come together? For a typical boss fight, Jude starts with Mystic, Lucky Card, and Jella Card, Yuli does some buffing, Arno debuffs with slow and locks the boss, and Raquel spams Intrude until dead. You could use this strategy for any boss and come out without a scratch. Yeah, this game is pretty easy, but only if you abuse the mechanics given to you. Similar to Shadow Hearts Covenant. I don't find easy games a problem, since I'm having so much fun with the game anyway, as well as feeling like a fucking powerhouse. I mean, a bunch of buffed up kids killing a bunch of adults? <laughs> That's a nightmare as shit. One more thing the gameplay offers are your own combo force skills. By standing in a hex with one or more party members, you can randomly get a chance for them to talk to one another and put together their abilities for new skills. Once they do, you permanently gain that ability, but the needed characters must be in the same hex and with the needed FP to use it. These can range from a normal pair, triple, or quadruple, Depending on the amount of characters used for the skill, a varying amount of force is consumed. Some are just normal attacks, but others are really cool, like Yuli and Arnaud's combo, in which they cast magic on any hex. This was useful for me, since I usually had them together anyway, and I could kill normal enemies from afar with it. Since one of the themes of the game is teamwork, they show it off rather nicely with this. Not to mention the final boss is killed only with a quadruple combo you gain at the final boss fight. The growth system is a bit interesting too, as there's a good amount of customization. Every level you have equates the points you can use to gain higher level skills earlier than you would. Gaining revive early, for example, is pretty damn helpful, so you won't have to buy revive fruits. Doing this, though, will lower your maximum HP and MP. You can change the ratio of reduction with the slider, so you can make it so Raquel reduces more MP than HP. While the gameplay is superb, some may argue at the change of how the dungeons work. The game is actually a platformer. I know, I thought it was fucking weird too, but I thought it worked well enough. Nothing too difficult or unfair. You have the abilities to slide, jump and double jump, and jump smash. You got your usual switches, trampolines, and moving platforms to go through, so nothing unique there. They do have this accelerator that lets you slow down time, but it doesn't get used very often. The main purpose of it is to collect hidden jella in the dungeons. Makes sense to me! Also, it's never explained how Jude got it, but he does use it in various cutscenes, which was a nice touch. There are two views for the dungeons. One is your normal 3D view, but you also got a side view, or 2D view, from other platformers like Sonic and Mario. Going in between these areas was pretty cool, and changes up the platforming. Another mechanic change from the dungeons were the tools. Before, each character had different tools that they gained throughout other dungeons, like Rudy's bombs or Ashley's knives. This time, you don't have a need for changing characters, since there's no individual tools, and all the tools are found in the dungeons themselves. Oh, and they don't follow you either. They're kept in photospheres, and you just go up to them to hold them. You can find various tools, such as swords, staves, and shields. There aren't that many, but oddly they decided to add a new one for the final dungeon. Really don't know why. The drawback of holding these tools is you're unable to jump with them, so this makes platforming more difficult. What they did add to these tools is that now you can add elements to them. The staff is useless on its own, but swing it in a flaming pot and you can shoot fireballs out of it. Or swing it into light and shoot teleporting light balls out of it. I found it could take some time aiming these shots right, especially the teleporting ones. After all this, I still found the original tool system much more effective, since you already had the tools at your disposal and had prior knowledge on how to use them, while also finding new tools. In this game, you first find the tools, then figure out later what to do. Or find the puzzle, and then find the tool later. And carrying them around was a bitch. Even if people argue about these changes, 
none can argue over the amazing soundtrack this game has. Some favorites of mine are Ghosts of Knights, which is played during non-Brionic bosses, the Brionic boss theme, the Shining Spear pierces the darkness, and Kresnik's theme, that is where the spirit becomes certain. I also really enjoy the final boss theme, Hauser Hazard. The rest are pretty decent as well. If the music didn't give it away, Hauser is the final boss of this game. I swear, I followed the story and everything, but they only mentioned stopping some divine weapon. There was no mention of Hauser, and the part didn't care anyway. So you just take him out and some scenes play, yada yada yada. Here's some random things that I compiled. During battles, if a character dodges or kills an enemy, they get an XP bonus by a certain percentage that tallies at the end. Pretty useful for bosses. There isn't a world map to explore, it's just go from one place to another. There's also not that many towns, and you can't explore inside the houses. I didn't know how much I'd miss the sprint button, until this game. Sliding all over the place brought joy to my heart. There actually aren't that many Lucky Angela cards, which I thought was odd since the previous entries had a good amount. This game has a lot of duplicators though, and there's only one duplicator door. The treasures for them weren't anything special either. I also like the battle transitions, how they differ between normal battles and boss battles. Before initiating an attack, you can tell how much damage you can do. Of course, if you hit a critical, it'll be more. You can rename skills, so even more personalizing there. Upgrading arms actually made sense in this game, since Yuli had the ability to control arms, unlike in the other games where you just go to some vendor who just happens to know how to upgrade these mysterious weapons. One crazy thing that I happily got footage on was a glitch I encountered with the menu. I don't know how I did it, but I was able to time me going into the menu and a battle starting at the same time. It opened the menu, but as soon as I wanted to exit, it crashed. I laughed my ass off at that. Overall, I gotta say, I'm impressed. It could have been a lot worse, and that's what I originally thought it was. See, this is exactly how I find underrated games. Even if you hear bad things, there's at least one good thing about the game you'll like. I try to make this review as detailed as I can, minus the story. Like I said, it's not really worth talking about anyway. It's also the shortest game in the series, closing for me at 22 hours, so it really doesn't overstay its welcome. Anyways, I hope I inspired a few of you to check this game out. If not, then at least it's soundtrack. Take care, everyone.